let me welcome you all to this week's Friday Fireside Chat with Jim McKelvey, uh, co-founder of Square, among many other wonderful things that I hope we'll get to talk about. Uh, while you're joining, uh, just a couple of uh, words of caution. Uh, this program is being recorded and will be captured, so do not say anything you do not want your mother to hear about afterwards. Um, <laughs> and, uh, um, and we'll be taking questions in the chat, um, so if you have some questions, I'll try to capture those. If we don't get to them live, we, we capture them and then we get back to you afterwards. Um, so, Jim McKelvey, welcome. You're in between locations at the moment, so I appreciate your carving out the, um, the, the time for us. Um, so, as I mentioned, uh, Jim McKelvey is a longtime entrepreneur, um, a serial entrepreneur, started many different businesses, uh, probably the best known of which is Square, uh, the payments processor. Um, but uh, it has also been a glassblower, uh, a, a author of textbooks, <laughs> someone who's uh, engaged in various kinds of things, and a student of entrepreneurial history. So, um, so welcome. And I thought perhaps we'd start off with um, your first business and meeting Jack Dorsey, because I think that's such an interesting story. <laughs> Yes, and, and Rita, just let me apologize. Like, I know I'm in my car, but it's the quietest place I could take this meeting. I've got good bandwidth, <laughs> and, uh, and I'm not driving, I promise. Okay. Um, so, um, so before but, we get moving, though, so I should also, this is all in uh, Jim's fantastic book, The Innovation Stack. I spent a chunk of the weekend with it, and it really is one of the most interesting books on entrepreneurship I've read. So just uh, as a ringing endorsement there, um, it's, uh, it's just full of wonderful stories and, and lived experiences and lots of great questions. So uh, over to you. <laughs> thank you. Uh, did you. Did you know the book started out as a comic? Did you know that? I think you mentioned that, yeah. Yeah, it was it was originally a graphic novel. The whole thing was supposed to be a comic book, but um, uh, and that's, that's available that's, online, right? Yes, yes, you can get a free copy of the comic at jimmckelvey dot com. But um, I'm glad you liked it. But okay, so let's talk about. Yeah, I'll, let me answer your question. Yeah, Jack and I started working together um, when he was 15 years old. Um, I had a company, actually, still have the same company, uh, and we were doing uh, this sort of marathon uh, programming uh, effort and recruited everyone we knew in the neighborhood. One of the people that we'd spoken to had been Jack's mother. She ran a coffee shop. We ran, we ran there often to go uh, uh, get chocolate covered espresso beans <laughs> so we could keep everybody awake. Um, and uh, she mentioned that her son liked playing with computers. We used a lot of computers. So Jack uh, actually showed up on his bicycle in the afternoon and uh, pulled an all nighter with us on his first day at work. So we sent him home at 5 a.m. and uh, he got in trouble with his mom. So <laughs> that, that was that was the start of my association with Jack. Now this was um, way before Twitter or any of those other um, things. Oh yeah, this was. I mean, this was almost twenty five years ago. Yeah, so it, it was a while. <laughs> Absolutely, um, and uh, so you were um, among other things a glass a, a glass blowing artist in some yeah. Of yeah, um, I uh, became a glass blower out of necessity. I graduated with degrees in computer science and economics, but at the time um, I was working for a startup and quit because I discovered the boss was a crook, and mm -hmm. I was not—I was not smart enough to figure out to set up another gig before I quit my current job. I see. And so uh, I just went in and quit, right? Like like you're supposed to do. Like, yeah, I'm out of here, right? So I quit. <laughs> the next morning, I was like, "Well, what am I going to do for a living?" And I didn't have any marketable skills, um, including <laughs> glass blowing. I, I, but I thought, well, maybe I can make my work and sell it. And so um, I couldn't because my work was really terrible. But I got very, very serious about it over the course of about a month. And I got my, the quality of my work up to a point where I could make a living. And then um, I picked up a gig with IBM uh, that basically flew me all over the country. And I developed a way of selling my glass into... Uh, galleries around the country. So, you know, at a pretty young age, I had a very good reputation in the glass world um, because I had all these named galleries. And, you know, once you get one good one, uh, they all sort of fall into line. So it was, it was actually a pretty good way to make a living. And you actually wrote a textbook about this, I understand. Yes. Uh, so I, I taught a class about glass blowing, and uh, it was, it became the most popular class at Washington University. Um, 
so we had 150 students and normally glass is taught by sort of apprenticeship where you you know watch the master do something and then the students try to replicate it um that's not possible with 150 students like you just it just physically doesn't work so i thought well i need a textbook and i looked and there were no textbooks there were literally no textbooks on the subject of glass blowing and you know you think with a 2000 year old you know practice somebody would have written something down well it turns out that there's, there's a massive culture of secrecy in the glass world which uh you know they used to kill you if you told secrets the italians you know that <laughs> very Italian they, they, they would make these glass daggers and they would stab the master to death if you know if he left the island oh yeah it's great stuff right um, so you know I mean I don't stab you to death anymore but um, it's uh, it's it was still even in my day frowned upon to share secrets and so nobody had written any of this stuff down so I wrote a textbook on glass blowing and uh, that was pretty good it uh, got translated into Norwegian uh, it's been heavily pirated um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a text on glass log. Quite the best uh, testament, right? That people <laughs> people take your ideas and steal them, right? Steal them, steal them. Yes, please, p please feel free to steal the innovation stack too. I mean, it's like this. this I'm not, not going to make so, money um, on the royalties on this one. Yeah. So uh, I guess what interests me, well, not well, there's many, many things that interest me, but the the inspiration for what became Square, and I think the pattern of this is really interesting because you and Jack were talking about starting some kind of business and sort of looking around for um, what what might be a, I think you call it a perfect problem uh, yeah. that you guys could solve. So it wasn't like the inspiration came first and then the entrepreneurial energy went behind it. It was almost like the other way around, um, which, which is different because that's not the narrative you usually hear about entrepreneurs, right? You usually hear about the apple fell from the sky and the, you know, the, the heavens opened and I had this inspiration and then I went and chased my dream. And this was sort of the other way around. You were, you were as I understand it from the book, you were talking and reading and thinking you wanted to start something. Um, and then the inspiration came out of the glass business. Yeah, I, and we're lucky we got the inspiration because the idea that Jack and I were about to pursue, I think was pretty lame. And I don't think Jack was excited about it either. Um, <laughs> but Jack and I had always enjoyed working together. And, you know, after he got kicked out of Twitter the first time, he was, you know, back in St. Louis and he didn't know what he was going to do. And he said, hey, Jim, why don't we start a company together? And I was like, great, what do you want to do? And he's like, I don't know, what do you want to do? So we had this <laughs> desire to, you know, sort of get the band back together, but we hadn't written any songs, right? <laughs> okay. So, um, uh, you know, fortunately, uh, you know, my, my horse died, my truck broke down, and then I had some inspiration for songs, right? You know, there was, that, that, that's the whole thing. Um, in, in the case of Square, I was actually in my glass studio trying to sell a piece of art, um, basically to pack up and move to California. I was, you know, like clearing the studio out and I really wanted to get rid of this thing. And it was expensive and it was ugly. And like, if you can sell something that's ugly for a lot of money, like do it. Right. So, so I was so happy to get this sale. And then all of a sudden it falls through cause I couldn't take an Amex card. And, uh, and that was the inspiration for Square because I looked at my mobile phone and I was like, why does this stupid mobile phone not take credit cards? Like it does everything else. Like it turns into a TV, you know, it turns into a video conferencing system. It, you know, it turns into a game or a book or a map or a radio. Like it turns into whatever I want. That's, that's what I, I consider my mobile device, this magic thing that like magically becomes whatever device I need it to become. Um, and it wouldn't turn into a credit card machine. So we made it do that. That's amazing. But it took, um, I mean, you, uh, you talk in the book about uh, having, having an idea, then creating a minor crime, then doing a confession, then committing a major crime. <laughs> I just think that's such an interesting way of framing how you launch an entrepreneurial business to investors. <laughs> well, yeah. So that you're talking about the pitch, the way we um, did the pitch was pretty dramatic. And I, I believe in drama during, during pitch sessions, uh, mostly because, I mean, these days I'm a VC partially. I, just a little bit of my career is venture capital. Um, but sitting through pitches is just so boring. Like, it's, it's almost as bad as reading a business book. Like, it's just that painful to sit there and <laughs> listen to this crap. And so I feel you know, like if I'm, if I'm the person sort of responsible for the, for the event, like I want it to be entertaining. And I don't care if it's a book or a speech. Uh, in this case, it was a pitch. 
And so we wanted a pitch that was uh, both dramatic uh, and shockingly honest. So the drama came uh, by taking people's money with this crude little credit card reader that nobody had ever seen before. Which you made, um, right? You, you yeah, invented oh, yeah, yeah. that. Uh, yeah, we, we um, so Jack did the software and I did the hardware. Um, you know, the hardware, I mean, that's, you know, this thing, not uh, unfamiliar at the time. You know, but nobody had ever seen something this small read a credit card. No. So, you know, we got a really crazy response from taking people's money. And it turns out, Rita, if you, if you take people's money, uh, along with that money comes their attention. <laughs> okay. And that, was that the minor they, crime? It, yeah. That, that, yeah. Oh, that broke a bunch of laws because um, <laughs> our system was completely like we were, I think, I think my count was 17 laws or rules that we had um in some way violated with each transaction so i stopped counting at 17 i'm not sure if that's the precise number but it was it was 17 or more um so uh you know we start with this and we get everybody's attention by taking their money and then we immediately slam them uh with this slide that uh jack it was this was this was jack's idea that i thought was brilliant um it was 140 reasons square will fail and so we listed everything, uh -huh. um, uh, including, I think, uh, being attacked by Amazon. I think that was one of our oh, 140 you, you reasons. I saw that. Which actually, I think, I think that was on there. But like we had Apple attacks, Facebook attacks. I think we had Amazon on there. You know, we had all the major tech platforms and, you know, alien invasions and meteors. <laughs> and like we, we just listed everything. Um, but the funny thing about that is that nobody does that. Nobody actually honestly discusses the reasons why a business might fail. Mm -hmm. If they're asking for money, they just paint everything, you know, with, you know, rainbows and unicorns and they say, Oh, it's going to be great. There'll never be a problem, you know? Uh, uh, but that's just not true. And everybody knows it. And so because it's not true, it sets up this dynamic where, you know, it's attack and defend, you know, the VCs are uh, defending and the entrepreneurs are attacking and it's this really hostile environment um, by being super candid about all the things that we thought could go wrong. It changed the dynamic. Like everybody was sitting on the same side then. And as a matter of fact, as we went through the 140 reasons, a lot of, a lot of the VCs that we were pitching would say, Oh, well, you know, we can help with that. So I had one guy, you know, talking about Amazon, he was on the board of Amazon. He said, well, if you, if you take money from us uh, you know, I'm on the board of Amazon and I'll make sure they don't, you know, brain rape you or, Attack, attack you or copy like you know he was he was basically offering us a solution to one of the problems that we've foreseen um so it totally changed the dynamic of the pitch mm -hmm. and um we had a shocking level of success just unheard of at the time we had uh, i think uh you know 21 pitches like 18 term sheets something like that yeah. i think there were a couple that we didn't get um you know we didn't get kleiner because they were afraid of uh yeah, Kleiner was afraid that uh, uh, they got some bad information from somebody who was pissed off. Uh, one of my uh, friends in St. Louis told them told them some bad information, uh, so they they dropped out. And then Sequoia dropped out uh, because I made a bad joke. Uh, um, but it was funny because Sequoia and Kleiner actually came in in later rounds. So, so last laugh time. Oh, they, they, they were laughing with us. They've, they've, they've done very, very well on those investments. So, <laughs> That's, yeah. great. That's great. Um, so what I think is really interesting is, um, so when you pitched them, the thing you told them about, and you've got this wonderful triangle diagram in the book, was like the visible market, you know, the stuff that's yeah. not the triangle. But what you were really aiming for, and I think this ties to a whole conversation in the book, um, about about being outside the city walls, you know, being the outlaw, being being able to see things. Um, and I thought maybe if you told the story of Bob and how you thought Bob and the credit card could kind of come together in a way that had, nobody would really seen before, something completely new. Yes. So um, so I have a friend who is, I mean, he's probably demonstrably crazy. He's been locked up. Uh, I saw him yesterday. He's he was in <laughs> the studio with me yesterday. Um, uh, and, uh, he's, 
featured prominently in the book because he was one of my inspirations, probably the inspiration for me, because uh, this is a guy who, um, I mean, I tell you a lot of funny stories about him, but the, 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 the bottom line is he's a very good glass blower. He's, he's exceptionally talented, very creative, uh, strong, dexterous, and, and, you know, basically on all objective measures, measures better than I was, okay, except for one thing, and that is I, weren't, I earned way more money than he did. When I, as a glass blower, and Bob, you know, has gotten so bad. Sometimes he has to live in his car, you know. So he's he's really um, uh, sort of unable to turn this talent into dollars. And so one of the reasons he can't is that you know Bob's had some run-ins with the law. He's had some bad credit, uh, and and as a result, he doesn't have access to the banking system. Like he can't do the things financially that I just sort of take for granted. And if you if you're if you're in the club you don't realize what it's like to be out of the club. You know, I hear, I, you know, so I'm listening to all these, you know, you know, people complain about, uh, about uh, their situations. And, and, and then it's really true. Like if you're not in the club, it's a completely different experience. You know, like, like if you're a different race, you will have a different experience with the police. Uh, you know, and I have friends who tell me this, who have different experiences than I have, you know, so, um, so Bob's not in the financial club. He's just not. And as a result, uh, he can't accept payment in the form that people want to offer it. So he can't sell his work. And so when we were building Square, my mind was basically uh, 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 focused on my friend Bob. And could I get a system that Bob could use? Um, and Bob's got a lot of strikes against it. But keeping him in mind was, was really helpful. Um, and, and what this did, um, interestingly, was it led us outside of the financial world. Because if you're going to include Bob, you can't bank with normal banks. You can't have normal uh, contracts. You can't, like all the stuff that is, that is set up is stuff that is set up for the existing market. And since we were building outside of that market, it basically meant Square was, as, as I describe it, an outlaw. But not an outlaw as in like we were trying to break rules, but an outlaw in the sort of archaic definition of the word, which meant somebody who who lost the protection of the law. So you know, if you were if you were outlawed in, um, you know, this is, you know, back in medieval Europe, uh, outlaws were people who had broken the law and therefore lost its protection. In other words, you could go up to an outlaw and kill him, and the because it was it was legal to kill somebody who was outlaw because they, 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 they effectively said, okay, screw you to the rules. And the rules so was like, okay, fine. And it was a terrible punishment. Um, and uh, we were outlaws in the sense that we had essentially lost all of the mechanisms that made the existing system work. So we had to build new mechanisms. That was what became our innovation stack. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about that because I think it's such um, a powerful concept. And the idea uh, is that, you know, you, you solve these problems intractable problems one problem at a time and create something that's a completely new kind of infrastructure and that that becomes because it's so interconnected and so you know, each thing has to be in balance with each other thing that somebody looking at it from outside says well i can copy that but they can't <laughs> they can't copy they can't. the whole yeah so it was this very interesting journey of discovery for me because um as you know, Amazon attacked Square and copied our product and undercut our price. And when Amazon does that to a startup, the startup dies or ends up being bought by Amazon, which, you know, probably worse. You use diapers.com um, as an example. Yes, it was funny. Diapers.com. Um, uh, they are a great example. It was funny. I found several really, really good examples of companies that have been obliterated by Amazon. And um, in every case, the people involved who I spoke with refused to go on the record. They were still so scared and so intimidated and so worried about what Amazon would do to them personally in the future that they, they would not go on the record. So I have all these stories that I can't publish. I can't use any name, but I use examples in diapers.com. That is a publicly known That's example, public example yeah. um, mm -hmm. you know, so, but I've got plenty of them. Uh, and uh, we were terrified and, yet we survived. Um, as a matter of fact, we didn't even survive. We actually came out a little bit better because when Amazon gave up, 
they actually mailed all of their uh, soon-to-be former customers uh, one of these little readers. And in doing so, I thought it was really cool. I mean, honestly, I, I can't just knock Amazon um, because, well, A, I'm selling a book, and B, uh, they are... <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> yeah. But they are actually sort of a noble adversary. Mm -hmm. Like, the way they handle themselves, mm -hmm. especially at the end, I thought was really cool. They didn't have to give our readers to their customers. They could have just said, oh, screw you, you know, and, and quit. But uh, they took care of their customers. And the best way they could take care of their customers was to give them Square. Um, and even though they were competing with us, like they still supported us on behalf of their customers. And that attitude, I think, is really super compelling. So mm -hmm. I, I do have a, a lot of respect for Amazon, but it, they're also terrifying to have as a competitor. Um, so I had to figure out how, how all this happened and how did we survive. And the answer turns out to be this thing called an innovation stack, which I had never seen before, or I hadn't, not true. I'd seen it. I'd never noticed it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it turns oh, out that... Just to say again, book just out. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, plug the book, plug the book. But, but the point is that I, I needed to answer the question, what the hell just happened? Okay, mm -hmm. so like there are people who fall out of airplanes sometimes without their parachutes opening and survive. So, you know, imagine you're in an airplane and the plane explodes and you fall 30,000 feet to the ground and you live. Well, the question is, why did you live? <laughs> and, and I had that same sort of survivor's guilt when Square lived. And so I went on this quest to find the answer. And the answer turns out to be that process that you just described, which is a process of invention, but not this sort of like um, seminar led invention where you sit there and say, oh, we need to be innovative and let's go let's go invent something or, hey, let's change this or let's be creative. Like, no, I'm talking about a more sort of primal survival type of innovation where you put yourself in such dire straits that innovation becomes the sort of last resort. But in doing so, you end up building something truly new. Mm -hmm. You're not copying at that point. And you talk a lot in the book about how most of what we do in life is copying. Like one of my personal favorites for innovation is these innovation boot camps. You know, we get everybody in a room and there's 10,000 post-it notes that die a horrible death, you know, while we ideate. Um, and it's funny. <laughs> and then and everybody goes back to work. And it's like, that was fun. <laughs> you know? Yes, yes. I, the T-shirt I'm wearing, I got from one of those things. Honest <laughs> to God, you know. Um, <laughs> Totally. Yeah, free clothing, right? I think they gave me socks too, but I won't show you those. Um, <laughs> I have socks from a conference I'm about to go to. So <laughs> I know it's socks. Actually, I got I get these shoes at the conference. They're now giving out shoes. Look shoes? <laughs> wow, Fabulous. This is nice conferences. Um, but the uh, uh, yeah, the, the, there's sort of different types of innovation, and what I was looking for was this. Thing that explained how these companies that were startups, still very frail, got attacked by incumbents who you would think would just kill them. They should die, and they don't. And then these companies, these little companies, end up dominating a whole industry. They become the biggest in the world or in their market. And, and, and you see that phenomenon repeated 50 times, and you go, oh, my God, wait a second. There's a pattern here. There, there is an honest to God pattern here. And, and then my first thought was, okay, uh, if there's a pattern here that's been happening for thousands of years, there must be dozens of books on this subject. So I just need to read those books. There are no books on this. I could find nothing on this. Mm -hmm. And then I was like, well, why the hell is that? Like, because one of the things I say in the book is, you know, like, if you think you've had an original idea, you have not had an original idea. And I, I don't think I've ever had an original idea. Um, somebody thought of it as well. They might not have done something with it, but they have certainly had the idea. So, um, so I've, I've unearthed the phenomenon that's been happening for centuries. Why hasn't somebody written about it? Well, it turns out they couldn't write about it for the last century, at least in the English language, which is all I speak, because the word doesn't exist to describe a business person who does something new. Mm -hmm. We do not have a word in English for that. We used to. 
It used to be the word entrepreneur. That's why the word entrepreneur was coined. But these days, entrepreneur is synonymous with business person. Yes. Right? So, I mean, like, as soon as these guys open up, like, I'm going to go order lunch from this company. I don't know if you can see. <laughs> like, I'm literally sitting in their parking lot hoping they open up. And the guy who opens this restaurant, I got a tremendous amount of respect for him. I like him. Um, but he, in my mind, is a business person. Mm -hmm. Because he's got a business and a that's a franchise but even if it was like an original restaurant there are a lot of restaurants that have been done before um that's business business is typically something that is measurable repeatable certifiable um you can go to a seminar you can go to a trade show you can hire an expert you can hire your competition's talent away like it's it's this different dynamic from doing something that has not been done before mm -hmm. Well, one of the things I really thought was very interesting that you capture in the book is is the the fourteen elements of Square's innovation stack. Like fourteen, that's a lot. Um, but but I thought it was so interesting the way that you frame it in terms of so we have to. Oh yes. Which I thought yeah. was so different than the way we normally approach business problems. It was not it was not sort of well just this, this would be cool, but it was like no no if we're going to accomplish that. We have no choice. We have to do this. And that's, that's something that a copycat, you know, that journey the copycat has not been on. Right. You, you can't do that if you're copying um, because you're never forced to do something. Um, and it's, it's a different way of behaving. And, you know, I wish it wasn't necessary, but at least in my world and in the world of the companies that I've studied, it's been a very, very strong pattern, mm -hmm. which is to say that these companies didn't seek to be innovative. Mm -hmm. They sought to survive and they refused to die and they were forced to do a dozen or more things differently. The innovation was not this thing that, they, you know, they read some book and they got inspired. And, oh, let's go innovate. You know, I, it wasn't that. It was like, holy crap, we're going to get eviscerated by Amazon or United Airlines or, you know, the banks are going to put us out of it. Like there, there were, you know, in one case, you know, the city burned to the ground where this, uh, you know, startup had, had opened the, you know, first little bank of its type. Uh, and uh, this was the great San Francisco earthquake. There was a little bank called the Bank of Italy. It was started by a kid who, by the way, knew nothing about banking. He dropped out of school at age 15, um, became a produce vendor. Like he sold lettuce. This is A.P. Giannini, right? This is A.P. Giannini, mm -hmm. um, one of my great heroes and, and the first person I ever consider a mentor uh, in my life because to me, he was, he was this embodiment of the entrepreneur, i.e. somebody who got into a business he knew nothing about, uh, was hammered by circumstances and survived and thrived. Um, and if you look at that pattern, that pattern repeats again and again. Mm -hmm. So... Um, you know, the question I always get asked is, well, like, how can I make myself innovative? And I ask, and, and I answer that by saying you, you do that by committing to a task that humanity has not figured out how to do. Like, that's the process. Very simple process. Take everything that humanity has done and then pick something that it hasn't done. Mm -hmm. And you say, okay, I'm going to do this. And that's really difficult. But if you commit to it and refuse to quit, you will, you will become innovative. Even if you're not an innovative person, you're, cause you're going to, you're going to wake up one morning. It's like the stuff's not working. You know, <laughs> the city is burning. The bank is closed. There are looters running around the town. This literally happened to Giannini. Uh, they had no safe, right? They just had a bunch of gold in a, in a building and, and like one, re one revolver, which in San Francisco, the turn of the last century was nothing like, like one gun. I mean, that, that basically meant you were a daycare worker, you know? Um, but uh, if you, if you put yourself in that situation um, and hopefully for good reason, but if you find yourself in this situation for good reason or not um, and refuse to die, you will become innovative. And the funny thing is innovation does not look, in that situation, like seminar-led innovation. It's this 
sort of primal survival, do anything, and who cares if we're breaking 17 laws attitude. Mm -hmm. And it, 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 it's brutal. I mean, it's not fun. It's mm -hmm. terrifying and scary, and um, it's not glamorous. Uh, you won't get support from your family. You won't get support from your friends. Not that your friends and family don't care about you. It's that they do care about you. It's that in their world, they're looking at you and they're saying, Rita, what the hell are you doing? What? We want, we love Rita. We want to protect you. Don't care. Come, come back into the herb. Come, come do the stuff that we all know how to do. Come do the stuff that we all know works. Okay. You're safe here. Stop that. And that's going to, that's going to be your feedback until you're way past the innovative part like the innovation tech will get built it'll start working you'll become you know rich and successful and powerful and your company will grow and then all your family will go, oh hey good job <laughs> yeah well it looks it looks really glamorous in retrospect so oh, yeah. Uh, yeah priya wants to know um what 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 are the top three criteria for the startups not to not die and succeed and i think we've talked about innovation stack we've talked about you know, not giving up on these challenges that you face. Is there any other thing you would add to that? Uh, there are a bunch. I would say the first and most important thing is to know the difference between business and entrepreneurship. Mm. I.e. recognize when you are in the world where copying is the best solution, and by the way, we live in that world most of the time. Like nothing, nothing around me, except maybe this car. Actually, I'm in a Tesla. So that's a pretty innovative vehicle. It's got an innovation stack of tech that actually has made Tesla a pretty darn valuable company. Um, they do a lot of stuff differently. It's not, you know, the, it just, the capacitors in front of the batteries are super interesting. I'm like, there's all sorts of probably 50 different things that are different about this vehicle. But as I look out around me, you know, I see asphalt. There's nothing original about that. Stop signs, those are not like, I see grass. Well, that grass is not original because it comes from, you know, forerunners of grass. I'm not original. I'm a copy of my parents. You know, I think there's, there's just originality usually doesn't work. Okay. And so we usually live in that world of business where we're copying for good reason. I'm not denigrating copying. I'm saying copy when you can't. But then I'm also saying you should also recognize that there is this, other world that we almost never visit because it's unpleasant and we only visit it when we're forced to but recognize when you were in that world and recognize that there are different rules that apply in that world and that's what i talk about in the book i talk about the rules in this in this world where like it is so rarely discussed that i couldn't even use a word in the english language i literally had to to write the book dust off an archaic definition of the word entrepreneur which, yeah, I mean, talk about boring. Like the book starts off with a like little linguistic seminar on the taxonomy of this, you know, term. Well, you talked about how you tried to learn about entrepreneurship by offering people rides in St. Louis. Yes, 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 yes. That was a disaster. That was a total failure. Yeah, I used to, you know, back when I was, you know, sort of first starting out, I wanted advice. I wanted experts. I wanted help, right? I want somebody to tell me the secret. So I, I, I came up with this trick of um, taking people to the airport. Uh, and you got to understand the taxis in St. Louis are, they're, they're, I'd say they're run by the mafia, but the mafia is like competent. Um, you know, like this is like the people who like couldn't get into the mafia. <laughs> and then now picture their spoiled kids. And that's who runs the taxi cabal in St. Louis. It's so bad. You know, and um, and like, so it was no problem at all for me to, uh, you know, get half an hour by, by just offering these people a ride to the airport. So, you know, clean the car, put on a suit, go to the seminar and say, hey, would you like a, a ride to the airport anytime you want? I'm happy to drive you. And you won't have to, you know, come out smelling like pine air freshener, you know. Um, and uh, it always worked. I'd always get these rides. Um, and I always asked these people who were very famous business people. These were, fam these were people who were so famous, they would come to St. Louis to give a presentation on their topic of expertise. So I had, I had access to all these, these you know, really noteworthy people. And I asked them for advice, and the advice was always crap. 
Um, and it wasn't because, again, they were trying to give me bad advice. It was that they were giving me advice for the world of business. And although I didn't recognize it at the time, I was living in this different world. I was living in the world of invention and entrepreneurship. I was doing stuff that hadn't been done. And therefore, my problems were different and the solutions to those problems were different. And they never gave me the answers that I wanted. And so you talk about uh, the inspiration being uh, AP Gina and uh, also Ingar Kempred at IKEA. And I find the IKEA story just fascinating because that is a business that, according to any strategy textbook on the planet, should not exist. You know, right. they're global in a world where it's heavy transportation costs and relatively low product value. They're, uh, you know, they're, they're, um, they're, their products themselves are easy to copy. They're very differentiated, but they charge low prices. You know, they shouldn't be. Like your, your typical textbook strategist is scratching their head. But I think it's the same pattern that you see when you think about what Camp Red did, right? They wouldn't allow him in the showroom, so he created a catalog. <laughs> they wouldn't let him in the city center, so he built in the suburbs. <laughs> you know, and all that kind of thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you get it. And, and by the way, you have, you have really brilliantly articulated why I chose Comprod as an example. Um, because Ikea shouldn't exist. Mm -hmm. And if you live in this world of business rules, and that's all you know, and you think the world works on this type of physics, it will say that is impossible. You have to basically have this different set of math. And um, I use a terrible analogy in the book of quantum mechanics, which, of course, nobody understands quantum mechanics and quantum computing, which like even if you've got a computer science degree, it's like, what the hell, the qubit? And, God, ugh, brain scramble, right? <laughs> um, but the point is, even though you don't understand it, there is this thing called quantum computing and there is this thing called quantum mechanics. And, and those are real phenomena to the point where we can actually build a device based on those phenomena that behaves totally differently. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Ikea is a great example because you're darn right. There shouldn't be an Ikea, let alone it be this massive multi-billion worldwide empire. We don't actually know how big Ikea is because it's private and the Compride family is super secretive and um, they ain't telling, you know, you know, no, no, I know. And uh, I mean, I, I, I actually studied IKEA for a while. And, and among the more interesting things was also their ability to kind of admit when they were wrong. Like when they first came to the United States, um, the people in the U.S. were buying flower vases and using them as drinking glasses. <laughs> Because, you know, in America, we like to pile up our glasses with ice and then we pour a little soda in it and we kind of think we're done. And, uh, and, and, um, and they wouldn't buy the curtains because we're not metric and they are. And, and, yeah. and, and. and so I think Campride was interviewed right around that time and he said, we find it completely unreasonable that Americans are unwilling to redesign their windows to fit our curtains. <laughs> you know? And they made this massive pivot. I mean, they just really took it very seriously. They said, we got this wrong. And that same mode. Yeah. Humility is, is this thing that I talk about in the book a lot. And it's this odd quality that I noticed in all these entrepreneurs. And it's not typically a quality you associate with bold, visionary, innovative people. Um, but boy, it's sure there. Um, the ability to do something knowing that it might not work mm -hmm. and to do something in a way that is uh, not guaranteed. And that makes you humble. Mm -hmm. um, and Comprod, um, I think, exhibits that. Giannini certainly exhibited that. Um, I met Herb Kelleher. Uh, I was going to ask you about Herb. I was gonna ask you about oh, my Herb. God. Have you met Herb? Did you ever I meet have Herb? I have met Herb. So my story, my Herb story, is um, I was relatively younger in my career, and I got handed this this sort of totally – unforgivable job of organizing the Strategic Management Society annual meeting. And the goal was to bring in, you know, fancy people. And then all the strategy professors would gather and sort of chat to them. And, yeah. and I was lucky enough to land her. And we were talking about, well, you know, we don't just want this to be a stupid conference where he shows up and whatever. And so I was partnering with uh, Booz Allen at the time. And we actually did a set for her, which consisted of a portable bar on wheels, a bottle of his favorite wild turkey <laughs> liquor, <laughs> and one of the Booz Allen partners. And he were sort of clinking glasses and having a chat. <laughs> it was just great. He was wonderfully gracious. 
Oh, Herb was so great. I, I, I dearly miss him. He's, he's the reason I wrote the book. Yeah. Oh, tell me more. Yeah. So, I mean, I, so I did all this research basically for my own answer, right? And I, I, wanted, I wanted to know what had happened to Square and why. Mm -hmm. I mean, I knew what happened. I, I wanted the why. And it just bugged me enough that I did research and I started, and then I, I stumbled onto this pattern and then I was like, Oh wow, this is really interesting. Oh, you know, like it seems to be something. And then I, you know, I stopped myself cause I thought, wait a second, this is, this is totally selection bias, right? Because if you, or I should say sampling bias, um, it's sampling bias. But if, if you choose examples from history, and you cherry pick the examples properly, you can convince yourself that anything mm -hmm. is true. And mm -hmm. I had all these historical examples, but the problem was all the people um, were dead or <laughs> inaccessible. Like Comprod was, well, he died as, a, as I was researching the book. I was trying to get, my wife speaks Swedish, so I was trying to get in touch with Comprod. But let me tell you, that guy's not easy to reach, okay? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so I was uh, unable to talk to anybody. But then I found that Southwest Airlines fit the pattern mm -hmm. and so I reached out to Herb and and Herb um you know was very gracious he gave me an afternoon with him and I brought all my research to him you know and I said uh you know Mr. Keller here are the things that I think I found and I think Southwest Airlines is a is an example of this phenomenon but I've never heard you talk about it you know do you think I'm crazy like is this does, does this is this working and Herb got really excited He's like, oh yeah, Jim. I think you're onto something. He's like, you need you need to write this. You need to write this down. You like you need to you need to work on this idea and share this idea, right? So um, so it's pretty daunting to get a homework assignment from one of your idols. <laughs> That's true. And and again, as my like, I didn't want to write a business book because I generally detest them. I mean. The, the number of business books that I actually enjoy reading is very, very sl slim. Um, and I was like, God, I can't just put another body on that pile. Um, so I thought, I'll write a graphic novel, right? I'll, I'll make okay. the whole thing a cartoon, right? Because the stories that I tell are really dramatic. I mean, you have Nazis and murders and evil gangs. Uh, there are men in capes. There's horses and cities. Oh, and what about Giannini's naked trip through the water? Yes, there's nudity. There's nudity. You know? Um, you have to give right. the context to that story, though. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah, no, no. Read the comic book. Come on. Get the book. There's nudity. <laughs> uh, and a murder and, uh, and an evil gang. I mean, like, there's all sorts of stuff, you know? And I thought, well, hell, this, this should be a comic. So I wrote a comic. Took me, like, a year. Did the whole thing as a graphic novel. Well, <laughs> That was stupid. Um, I finished this thing. I didn't finish it, but I had it like pretty much together. And I was so excited to show it to Herb. I called up Herb and uh, he hated it. <laughs> Just hated it. You'd spent how and long working on it? I spent about a year and a half working on it. You know, cause I wanted it to be really cool and I'm slow and it, you know, a lot of revisions and revisions. But I showed it to Herb, and, and he, said, he said, Jim, I know what you're doing, but I think you're trivializing this uh -huh. thing that's very important. And, I mean, if you knew Herb Kelleher, this was, this was not an expected response, at least for me. I, I don't know him that well. But I, I thought he was this, you know, sort of super fun guy. And he was, but he was also had this very serious tie. And if you took a serious topic and trivialized it, which he felt I was doing, um, it he, he didn't want it and so he has to be left out of the book and i said well i'm not leaving you out of the book sir i will rewrite it as a book and he was fine with that so that's how it that's how the graphic novel became the book that you read mm -hmm. um the other thing that i think herb was doing and i i, I wish he i wish he was here to ask because he died um I, I don't get to talk to him anymore but you know i was too eager to put a cape on Herb Kelleher. I was too eager to tell these stories that sort of like hero stories, which sort of fits the graphic novel format. And I think that's a real mistake. Mm. 
because heroes are people who are different from us. And if you see the entrepreneur or the person who, you know, builds an innovation stack as a hero, you are way less light. You, you, you are more likely to disqualify yourself when you uh -huh. come into that moment gotcha. where you can either act or quit. Okay. So let's say you're running along in your life and everything's fine and you, everything's working for you. And then all of a sudden something happens and your solutions no longer work. And maybe you look for a solution and society doesn't have a solution. Okay. So you've now hit the, hit the edge of what we know as humans. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the only way to solve this problem is to be innovative. Okay. Now you have to do something differently. You're forced to do that if you want to solve this problem. Okay. Now, if you think that only heroes get to take that last step, and you're not a hero. I'm not a hero. I'm totally terrified of most stuff, you know. Uh, like when my wife says we have to talk, my hands sweat. Okay, <laughs> that's how bold I am, right? But if you think the line is is to separate out the heroes from the non-heroes, you'll stop. You won't do anything. And that's exactly what I want to bust in the book. I basically say, look, you know, here you have biggest bank in the world founded by literally a kid who dropped out of school at age 15, no formal training in banking, knew nothing of banking, built the biggest bank in the world. I'm not talking a successful bank. I'm talking everything you think of as banking is because of what Giannini did. Like your concept of a bank did not exist 100 years ago. It was completely invented by this produce vendor. Like you think it's okay to walk into a bank and talk to somebody? Well, in the old days, you couldn't do that. Uh, let alone if you were in a anything but the elitist elite classes, you couldn't go to the bank. Uh, term loans, car loans, home loans. I, Giannini, like he invented branches. Oh, you think your branch has, branch has multiple? Giannini, like this is all his stuff. Um, completely unqualified. Jack and I, no qualifications at all in payment. Zero. I mean, I'm a glass blower. Jack's only pro professional credential is he's a certified massage therapist. In Missouri. Is that right? I didn't know that. Yeah. I, it's probably it, it's probably lapsed, but um, yeah, he was. He was a certified massage therapist, um, and he never even graduated from college. So, like, you know, what are we qualified to do? I mean, Kelleher, he was a lawyer. Didn't know anything. But you about say he plan. didn't start out. He wasn't like the founder of the company. He was its lawyer. No, no, no. He wasn't. Uh, he was one of three guys. You know, <laughs> but they they really rejected the common beliefs of the airline industry. They mm -hmm. built an airline without copying anything from United or Brana. Mm -hmm. um, so like one of the reasons I wanted people to read the book was because one, it'll probably help you, but two, I guarantee you know somebody who needs to read the book. I mm -hmm. guarantee you have a person, because I had a person in mind when I was writing the book, mm -hmm. and the person I have in mind is incredibly complicated. Com she's incredibly, she's complicated, but she's also competent. She, she very, very smart, very hardworking, but every time she comes against, comes up to a problem where she feels unqualified to solve that problem, she quits. Mm -hmm. She says, well, I can't do this. I'm not qualified. Now, my response to her is a little nuanced because sometimes you absolutely should be qualified. So literally the second we get out of this car, I'm going to jump in an airplane and fly uh, in these terrible clouds uh, and I have, I've had to study and read this book. This is a book on the new avionics system that I'm trying to learn how to use. Um, I'm actually a qualified pilot. Okay. Ooh. Which is possible these days. You can, you can become qualified. I've spent 10 years learning and I'm about to go learn more. Are I'm you flying yourself? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, wow. But I'm training. I mean, this is a training flight. I'm going to go do some stuff with a new, new cockpit. I got to learn how to push buttons and stuff. Um, and I'm not qualified yet. Uh, uh, to do certain things in the air, but I can fly a plane. Um, but if I want to fly a plane today, there is a standard that the world requires. I have to get drug tested. I have to pass a written. I have to pass a flight test. I have to fly a certain number of hours. I have to do certain uh, maneuvers. I have to have, you know, a certain level of health. I, all these things have to have, have to be in order for me to be qualified because it is possible today to be, be qualified as a pilot. But the first human to fly an airplane either Orville and Wilbur Wright, because they flipped a coin to see who it would be. Neither one of them were qualified. It was impossible to be qualified to be the first person in the air. 
Like, they weren't qualified. It's impossible to be qualified if you're the first person to do it. That's and my friend who I wrote the book for, I think of her, and I think, what a loss to the world mm. when she disqualifies herself. Mm -hmm. When she sits there and says, I can't do this. I don't know that that's true. Like, she might actually be able to do it. But I know she'll never do it if she doesn't try. If she doesn't have the ability to recognize where that world ends of where you can copy the solution and be qualified, and, and where that world begins where you have to actually innovate and do stuff that's really unpleasant, um, she's always going to stop at that barrier. And so that's why I wrote the book. And, and believe me, the book, the book was excruciating to write. I mean, it's been rewritten. It's now in its eighth draft. I published the eighth draft of the book. Um, but the point is to get this message out there that, look, what we've been taught of as innovation is seminar crap that, I don't know. I mean, if you want to collect Patagonia jackets, fine, have fun. But it's Uh, experience in, 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 in these worlds. So um, hopefully you'll get something out of it, but if you don't, I guarantee there'll be a friend. Mm. Cool. So Benefit. one of the things you talk about is, um, and I think, I think this, this idea of how it feels is super important to the point you just made because, you know, we have this idea that, oh, you know, Richard Branson decided to start, you know, an airline and champagne popped and he jumps out of buildings in a bungee jumping cord. And, and you know, it's just this. Well, that's um, just Branson. Like, and, he's, like, yeah. Well, but I think, I think sometimes we, we, we sort of have this idea that it's got to feel really great. You know, it's, it should be a pleasant feeling. And what you talk yeah. about is fear. Um, you talk about humility, you talk about feedback as absolutely core to getting, I guess, getting each piece of this innovation stack built. Yeah. Um, so fear's a tough one. Um, and I've never been able to do anything without the, the significant, without sort of fear. Mm -hmm. Um, honestly, I'm a little afraid about what I have to do this afternoon. Um, but what I've learned over time is that even though I'm afraid I can keep functioning, mm -hmm. um, and I think that, and again, like this is, this is really sort of where the, you know, the, the book gets very personal because, uh, if you read Comparar's memoirs, uh, Comparar's memoirs, if you talk to Herb Kelleher, if you talk to these people or read what they've ever written, uh, you'll find that they were very afraid. The Comprod talks a lot about, you know, crying himself to sleep at night with all the things that were going wrong at Ikea. And um, it's, it's, a, it's an unpleasant place to be. You know, I'm not, I'm not trying to sort of promote innovation as this really cool thing. I think, it's, I think its effects are very positive, but the process is sort of brutal. And, um, and because you are used to things that work, it's scary because you will not have that guarantee. And we're used to living in a world where there's guarantees. You know, we're used to the, living in a world where, you know, you play by these rules, you get these results. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't work when you're doing something that hasn't been done before. Well, I love your analogy about being a pilot. And it, it sort of ties to an observation I make in, in my book, which is that, you know, it took, I think it took three years from that first flight at Kitty Hawk before the rest of the world figured out what this actually meant. I mean, it took oh, yeah. a long time for, I mean, yeah. and it was funny, I, that actually was what prompted the, my, my writing my book, um, which was so this gradually then suddenly phenomenon. And uh, this historian wrote about that first flight and said, went to look in the New York Times the next day, surely this revolution would be recognized. A week goes by nothing, a month goes by nothing, two years, nothing. It took literally three years from that first flight at Kitty Hawk before the world kind of went, what? Manned flight, we can do this repeatedly? <laughs> you know, it just, and I think that's a big part of the issue as well, which is you don't know what you've got on your hands, right? Until sort of it passes through that inflection point and then people sort of go, oh, <laughs> I didn't know that's what it could do. 
It, it's absolutely true. And an interesting corollary to that is that new ideas, for some reason, take root better in crises than in boom times. Yes. Well, I think that's one of the so, opportunities we have now. You know, I mean, there's I so, so much There's so much that's on the table right now that six months ago wouldn't have even been talked about. Yeah, there is true uh, suffering happening right now. I'm sitting here in the parking lot. That's a, that's a movie theater. That thing is empty. These guys are basically closed that whole sec. I mean, there's, there's a lot of there's a lot of pain. There's a lot of pain right now. And um Unfortunately, that seems to correlate with people being receptive to new ideas. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because when things are going well, well, why would you consider anything new? You know, but if all of a sudden your world's in chaos, then perhaps that's the time to be open to new things. Well, and I live um, near Princeton, New Jersey, and a lot of the technologies that became Silicon Valley were invented right around here. But well, all the Bell people- but all yeah. the people around here, they work for at and you know, they work for Bell Labs, they work for, like, why would I go and start something new, like completely new and give all that up, right? So it, it, it affects the pattern of innovation as well. Indeed. So um, we're, we're nearly at time, and I know you've got a big, important job to do this afternoon, but where do people find out more? So where do they learn more oh, about Jim's world? Uh, so um, I'm, I'm generally not on social media, uh, but jimmckelvey.com, uh, it's got the book, it's got all the other books. Um, if you want to learn how to blow glass, um, it's got the comic for free. You can get the comic. Um, and that's, that's basically it. Jim McKelvey.com. Jim McKelvey.com. Sort of okay. shopping. Yeah. So. I'll, do, I'll do one more book plug. Fantastic book. It really is worth it. I mean, I spent much of my Labor Day weekend, you know, curled up with this book. And my oh, husband's thank like, you. yeah, my husband's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm really having fun preparing for this Friday fireside chat. So <laughs> it was great. What a privilege. And uh, do keep in touch. If I can be of help, let me know. Likewise. Thank you, Rita. Thank you. Bye-bye.